Uh, today, we are going to discuss a very, very critical question of the Chinese Communist Party. Is it a threat to humanity and the rules-based world order or not? Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, at, a, at a topic that I've been uh, working on for the last two and a half years. And I think it's a very uh, important uh, uh, topic to be spoken, especially in India, because it is a major effect uh, to India. So today I'll be speaking on the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And uh, give me a second to just share my uh, PowerPoint presentation with all of you. Uh, now, before uh, you know, we begin talking about uh, CPEC, uh, which is one of the legs of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative that the Chinese have launched. Uh, I would, you know, just take five minutes to briefly uh, tell all um, our listeners that what exactly is the Belt and Road Initiative. I will not go into uh, really technical terms, but in a very simple language, tell you that it is an idea that is conceived entirely by China, executed by China, and it will definite, it is definitely going to serve the Chinese cause. Now, uh, if you look at this map, this has um, the, uh, because Belt and Road has two aspects. One is the land uh, borders, and also one is the maritime domain. So how it is going to connect, uh, you know, different areas now, what is it connecting? Uh, that is very important. Now it is connecting production centers in China which uh, with natural uh, resources and markets around the world. So it is, and what is it built on? It is built on a, uh, so China is building this communication artery. It is not uh, going, you know, like uh, in 2017, when uh, there were the first Belt and Road Forum was to take place in China, there were, uh, uh, there were quite a lot of videos that were released as part of propaganda. And all these videos were actually in English. They were not for the Chinese uh, domestic audience. All of them were in English. And, you know, they tried to, the Chinese tried to explain all of us how simple this Belt and Road Initiative is. So there was this video where an American father is trying to explain his three-year-old uh, three daughter what Belt and Road is. So the lines that he says, you know, kind of how the Chinese were portraying this Belt and Road. So he says that this, is an initiative by President Xi Jinping for the global good. And in India also, when India refused to, you know, kind of join this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, there was a lot of criticism that we saw in India, especially that India should join it. It is uh, the second chance of globalization that we are going to miss. Now, look at all what is happening now. As we go through the presentation, we will realize that the Belt and Road Forum is nothing for the global good it is definitely for the chinese good uh, and uh, you know it is it is to put used china surplus manpower the financial resources the idling financial resources unused infrastructure and technological capabilities of china's huge state owned enterprises uh, now bri definitely we also have to understand why the chinese initiated so BRI is an instrument to fulfill China's dream and uh, not any other country's dream. Now, what is China dream is very important to understand because if we don't understand what Chinese, uh, China's dream is, we won't be able to understand what purpose the Belt and Road Initiative and CPEC that is part of Belt and Road Initiative is going to serve. Now, this formulation of the current form of China dream is based on a book that was written by a colonel in 2010. The book's title was The China Dream. As soon as Xi Jinping came to power, and even before coming to power, he started quoting from this book. And at the 19th Party Congress, which was held in October 2017, after which you see uh, the US-China trade war actually starting, uh, he gave a very bold timetable for China. Now this bold timetable included, now China Dream 2021. Under this, it will be rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. Now this is of a direct consequence to India because under this, they promised that by 2021, they're going to recover all the lost territories that they had lost out during the 100 years of humiliation. 
that is to the western powers. Now that includes parts of India, Arunachal Pradesh, Ladakh, and that also includes Taiwan. It includes the whole of South China Sea, East China Sea. So that is the first step, you know, that this dream had. Now then the second was 2035, made in China. The US trade war, actually China trade war, targets this specific, uh, you know, um, target that is made in China. And then by 2049, Xi Jinping said that China is going to become a global power with influence around the world. And when he says this, he means that by 2049, it will either replace the US or surpass the US. Now, this is very important when we uh, talk about uh, uh, wh what BRI does. So BRI is one of the instruments why uh, that will serve uh, prob uh, that will serve this dream of China. So uh, what is uh, so what they are doing? The Chinese they are using this uh, you, their U.S. dollar uh, fourteen trillion economy. They are using that to make inroads into the African continent, the Middle East, and we are seeing that how it is dividing the European Union, especially the East European country and the Western European countries. So, and uh, we have already seen that they have made major investments, substantial investments in Pakistan, India's neighborhood, especially of strategic importance to India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and Maldives. We have seen throughout last three, four years how China has expanded its, uh, you know, foothold in all uh, in India's neighborhood, and also how uh, countries like Sri Lanka, and there are a number of countries like Sri Lanka who have not been able to repay the debt that was given to them by the Chinese. And uh, in a way, they have, you know, parted away with a part of their territory to the Chinese. This map is of the countries that are endangered when it comes, uh, you know, that have the danger. Uh, already they are on the brink of crisis. They have already taken a lot of debt from China. And uh, there was a survey that was conducted, which said that these uh, countries are definitely facing, uh, they are going to face a debt crisis very soon. And all and few countries are already facing these debt crises. You see that Pakistan in, is in this, and Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Nepal, Myanmar, Malaysia, Maldives, Sri Lanka, we have already seen. So these are the countries, you know, that survey said that they are already at risk because of the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, as I said initially, that it was portrayed as something that is being done for the global good, and that China is going to provide an infrastructure for all these countries, more jobs will be developed, and you know, uh, how things will progress. But uh, there was another survey done by the European Union of Cham uh, Chambers that said that nothing like this is happening. The European companies are also not getting the projects. Forget about, uh, you know, other countries. The U.S. companies are also not getting. Of the total projects that have gone so far, 89% of the projects have actually gone to the Chinese companies. So there is no... Now you have to keep this in mind when I talk about CPEC. Because CPEC was projected that it is going to benefit Pakistan. Now, already I have stated that 89% of the contracts have gone to the Chinese companies. And also the process that is there for bidding is not transparent. So the local economies or the uh, countries where Belt and Road is uh, going, uh, they are not getting any benefit out of it. So, of course, we all realize, people who watch China, who study China, that Belt and Road Initiative is not an economic project as it was portrayed by the Chinese. It has strategic implications and definitely military implications. Now, uh, why I say this is because we are focusing on CPEC and CPEC has a very important aspect, which is Gwadar, which is uh, now being referred as a, a logistic naval base by the Chinese uh, uh, language uh, military literature that, you know, we have been reading. And you can just, you know, just see the points that I have already mentioned. I don't want to go into detail because I want to focus more on CPEC. Now, this is the map. You can see how CPEC is going right across the spine of Pakistan. It is very important to understand that how it goes through. Of course, we see it goes through 
uh, POK also, Gilgit Balistan region. But it goes through right through the spine of Pakistan. This is this map is very important because uh, also it uh, you know all these areas that it is cutting across are rural areas. So uh, you know when I, I talk about the social fissures that China is causing in Pakistan, this map will uh, help you relate to it. Now China Pakistan economic corridor is definitely one of the most publicized. Uh, corridors in this whole Belt and Road Initiative, and one of the first ones to get maximum funding, is they have already started multiple projects under it. Okay, now I have given the figures uh, about how much investment and everything is done. I don't want to go into details, but uh, this corridor will provide it's not a benefit to Pakistan, it is definitely going to provide a safer and shorter overland route you know uh, for chinese energy shipments from the persian gulf and africa through pakistan and save millions of dollars in shipment fees for the chinese thus one of the major you know part of the project if built purely on economic consideration is to facilitate china not pakistan we we really have to understand that and as i said that from it runs from north to south down the spine of pakistan through its rural areas extremely important to keep this in mind then there was a study before cpec you know uh, was uh, when it was launched there was a study done by deloitte which is very interesting because this uh, you know uh, this study said that over 700000 direct jobs are going to uh, be created from 2015 to 2030 for the pakistani local population now that has not been done the figures that I'll give you will tell you that uh, actually, practically on ground, very few jobs have been generated for the local Pakistanis. And most of the projects are being created by Chinese engineers, Chinese laborers. Already we have Chinese security companies here, and a presence of 30,000 Chinese security personnel are already in Pakistan, and especially in POK which again is very important for India. Now, uh, okay, now this is the projection of the job. They said, the study said 700,000 jobs, even if you look at the official CPEC websites and uh, the Pakistani ministers when they were, you know, on Twitter and all, and they were uh, telling everybody what this uh, wonderful project is going to do for Pakistan. So uh, against the 700,000 jobs, the estimated jobs as of on uh, in 2019 is 13,800, but the actual jobs that have been created for the local Pakistanis is actually just 4,000. And last year, the there were only nine posts that were advertised on the official, uh, you know, uh, Pakistani uh, handle of CPEC were nine. So you can look at the positions also that have been uh, created for uh, Pakistanis. Now, uh, it is also very important for us to understand what it has done to the local community, and especially communities, local communities, fishing community that is around Gwadar, and also, uh, you know, POK. Now, I mentioned in 2017 when uh, the first um, Belt and Road Forum was happening in Beijing, and there was such, uh, you know, uh, or, I mean, everybody was talking about it. There were so many people who had gone. The Pakistani prime minister was there. But back in Pakistan, at that point of time, in Gilgit, Balistan especially, there were demonstrations and Baluchistan's, there, there were demonstrations against the CPEC. Now, why these demonstrations were there? The local people were not happy. They were saying that it is not China-Pakistan economic corridor. It is actually China-Punjab economic corridor. Now, Punjab region we know in Pakistan is one of the most well-developed areas. So all the projects they were saying are actually going to Punjab and Punjab is benefiting. Gilgit, Balistan and Baluchistan locals, they said, we are not benefiting out of it. And secondly, they also raised slogans saying that this will lead to the, this is a road to Gulami. So of course we all understand road to Gulami means road to slavery. So there were uh, slogans that were raised in both regions when uh, meetings were happening in Beijing. Also, uh, uh, there are a lot of articles that were published also in Dawn, where uh, the locals expressed their frustration 
and they were saying that CPEC is doing nothing when it comes to their livelihood. And especially there were no studies that were done before development of, of this Gwadar port that how it is going to adversely affect the local population, and especially the fishermen there. Now, again, I'm saying why it is not benefiting again and again, I'm stressing on the point because it was uh, you know, projected that it is going to benefit Pakistan, but it is not benefiting anyone. In fact, uh, you know, China's own counsel, a journal in Karachi, Lee Bijian, who was posted in India during the Doklam crisis, he says that uh, the Chinese companies, you know, they are helpless because uh, the, the quality of workforce in Pakistan is very low. So they have to bring in people from China. Now, another issue is that already China and Pakistan have a free trade agreement. They had signed in 2007. And because of that, there were adverse effects on their leather footwear industry. A lot of people, uh, like I've mentioned, more than 20,000 people have lost their jobs. Now, CPEC, what it has to do is uh, it has to you know, compensate for these jobs also and also bring in new employment, which, is in, which it is not doing. OK, and uh, there's also a lot of uh, questions on the economic viability of CPEC. Like I mentioned, the China is not giving any donation to anyone. It is not giving any aid to any country. Whatever money you are getting under BRI, it is a loan. It has an interest rate and interest rate as I high as 7 percent. So many countries, of course, they welcome the money. They welcome the infrastructure that is coming in. But they forget that they have to repay all these loans. And then comes the debt trap. Now, Pakistan is also facing the same thing. So uh, the loans that are given, definitely Pakistan will not be able to pay it. And Pakistan's uh, gov bank, uh, bank of Pakistan governor made a statement back in 2016. And he was immediately removed when he said that Pakistan will not be able to pay the debt that uh, China is giving them. Now. Only Gwadar region is the region where China is giving aid to Pakistan and not loan. So it tells us how important Gwadar is for China. And why it is important, we all know, because it gives it direct you know, access to the Indian Ocean. And Gwadar port is wholly developed by the Chinese. There is a 10-foot uh, high uh, wall around the project. The locals are not involved. Even the accounts is handled entirely by the Chinese, though the Pakistanis are partners in the profit, but they don't know what is happening in the project. They have no say in the project. So uh, I think CPEC's success also entirely depends on Pakistan's ability to export goods and services. And you know that's how they are going to benefit from it. But Pakistani analysis, they have already warned that the sectors of economy will have to compete with the cheaper Chinese products. India has already seen that. Now, Pakistan, of course, uh, you know, will have to face it. So that the analysis have already said. Now, another aspect is that not only it is not generating any jobs for the Pakistanis, it is not bringing any uh, development to Pakistani economy, but the Pakistanis are actually paying for the security of CPEC. Now, because we know it goes through uh, terrain that is not uh, very peaceful because it goes through Baluchistan and Baluchistan has, is, uh, you know, not peaceful. So for that, the Chinese have always been worried about its safety. Now, uh, whatever is happening today between India and China, that is also partially because the Balakot strikes, one of, uh, one of the, uh, you know, the experts said that one of the strike missed uh, the Chinese investment, it was a power pl plant that was by the Chinese by 30 kilometers. Now, Chinese at that time also got worried. And uh, they are really worried that if India strikes Pakistan, especially POK, this region, they have invested hugely. So now this is uh, one of the reasons why they've always been worried. And of course, Pakistan, the terrorist, uh, terrorist organizations in Pakistan, uh, they are worried because of uh, that. And then Baluchistan, we know they, they have a separatist uh, movement going on there. So who is paying for the security? The Pakistanis are paying for it. So already in tw uh, on 24th September 2016, the Pakistani government, they decided to meet 
uh, these expenses of securing the CPEC projects by adding 1% more to the cost of all central energy projects. So they are recovering from the consumers. So who is paying for even the security of um, you know, CPEC projects? It is the Pakistanis that are paying. And they have raised special infantry divisions to, the Pakistani army has raised uh, special infantry divisions to guard CPEC. And for that also, the cost is really high, which the Pakistanis have to bear. Now, uh, as I said, the social fissures in Pakistan because of CPEC are very, uh, very clear. Now, I uh, recent, you know, in the last one or one and a half years, a lot of reports are coming in for, uh, from Pakistan. And uh, the sources for this is actually Pakistani news channels, where a lot of women in Pakistan are being targeted especially, and they are sold off to uh, Chinese who are working there, you know, Chinese engineers and laborers who are working in uh, Pakistan. So now these women's family, they are uh, actually promised uh, that their uh, one male member of their family will get a Chinese visa. And of course, uh, you know, they are given some money. And um, a 13 year old girl that was sold by her family, actually was the one who called one of the news channels in Pakistan and they raided. So that was without informing anyone. The higher authorities had no idea. And that is how this whole scandal came into limelight. There's also a Chinese there, a Chinese woman who's actually running a brothel there. And it is, you know, serving the Chinese men. Now, these things, especially in South Asia, we might say it is not, I don't know, maybe someone would say, oh, it's not such a big thing. But in South Asia, especially in uh, Pakistan, these things are highly sensitive. Right now, we don't see a lot of the Chinese embassy actually came out with a statement saying we are not involved in any of this. And uh, now this is going to create problems. For now, they are targeting the Christian community, Pakistani Christians. But slowly as they start targeting the community, this definitely will be one of the one of the factors that going to see uh, that will see a lot of protest in Pakistan against the Chinese. Now, uh, the presence of Chinese workers and their habits definitely will come into a clash with the Orthodox Muslim community. Now, uh, sorry for saying this, but uh, the China you know, there's a saying that a Chinese man cannot stay without his wine, pork, and women. Now, all these things, all the three things, if you see. They come into direct clash when it comes to the orthodox Muslims that are residing in the rural areas of Pakistan. And this whole, uh, you know, this whole uh, CPEC is going through rural areas of Pakistan. So these things will definitely have an impact. They are not having a, a very uh, huge impact now, but in the future, they are going to definitely have, you know, uh, effect on CPEC. Now, already few Islamic political parties that have been active in a couple of, uh, you know, decades, especially Tariq e Taliban and Lakshare uh, Jangvi, they have already given warnings. In fact, to Nawaz Sharif also, that beware of your new friend, your new foreign friend, China. They are spoiling our, uh, you know, culture. So it is not that CPEC has not faced any opposition in Pakistan. It has faced quite a lot of opposition from the locals, we don't hear it because the Chinese government and Chinese army is definitely backing CPEC. Now, there are also militant Islamic groups that we know, and they have also kind of targeted uh, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, companies and the Chinese that are coming in because of CPEC. And the presence, of course, of these thousand workers, that is of Chinese workers, they are also uh, also not benefiting uh, Pakistani economy in the way that it is, you know, at least they are buying Pakistani products, be it food items or something. Now, there are supermarkets that are exclusively opened by the Chinese. They serve the Chinese from meat grinders to noodles to all the spices. Everything comes from China. So there's only one person who might be employed, who might be carrying everything. That would be Pakistani. Everything else, you know, the, it caters to the Chinese uh, needs and it is run by the Chinese. So in that way also, it is not helping the Pakistanis in any way. Now, when it comes to CPEC, uh, we in India should also look at how it is just not an economic project, like I said, 
but it will have it has military implications now pls western theater command that is also you know if india and china whenever we have a border skirmish or whenever we have anything bigger than that it's actually the western theater command that will take now, the same western theater command is also responsible for safeguarding the chinese workers investments and projects in cpec now china is creating a division a uh, strength a private army for deployment in different areas where cpec projects are going on so they are right in pok right up to you know just our border with pakistan now gwadar of course is the most important centerpiece of this whole china pakistan economic corridor for the chinese now that is very very important so why it is important because the pakistanis have already granted sovereign guarantees to the port facilities and entirely managed as i said by the chinese so this gives direct access to them uh, especially uh, to the indian ocean and the pakistani military literature is already talking about giving donating uh, the first air chinese first aircraft carrier liaoning to the pakistanis that is going to be stationed in gwadar now uh, i think uh, it's very important and pertinent in this question is a remark earlier in july this year by an officer of the pla western theater command who said that they have intensified training of this command specially that is you know that uh, the western theater command and they are going to build global capability so now china is not only using pakistan to use, they are not using it as a deterrence for india but they are going to use pakistan for their global ambitions now that is why pakistan and cpec cpec is extremely important to the chinese now in conclusion i will uh, you know say that cpec will definitely have problems it is already having problems even the pakistani governments have government uh, subsequent governments have renegotiated with the chinese but the major problem that is is the way both countries look at this project so for uh, pakistan it is a project that will you know take it take pakistan out of its economic problems so pakistan the, the way both countries are looking is entirely different for china it has a strategic object and it views this corridor more as an essential stepping stone towards global leadership now when objectives are different of both countries the way they look at it and the way the local population is now you know stirring against uh, this project it will definitely face problems in the future but it is an extremely pro uh, uh, you know important project for the chinese so the just uh, so the chinese have put their full might behind it so uh, that is where i would like to end my presentation uh, thank you everyone uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, join this uh, very important discussion. Uh, you know, uh, since uh, the Chinese Communist Party established the totalitarian uh, regime in 1949, uh, it violated uh, human rights and suppressed uh, the fundamental freedom of uh, the Chinese people um, very uh, severely. So. Uh, like uh, the the killing of uh, the Kuomintang uh, soldiers, uh, the killing and persecution of um, uh, landowners, and 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 many um, waves of uh, political movement, uh, like uh, uh, the Cultural uh, Revolution, and and many many uh, these uh, these uh, like humanitarian disasters, and um, and uh, uh, tens of millions of Chinese people uh, died of this political persecution and, and dead of the Great Famine. Um, and, and people uh, know in 1989, uh, the Tiananmen Massacre. Uh, so Chinese government um, used the tanks and the machine guns to uh, kill um, uh, hundreds, if, uh, if not thousands of uh, protesters and, and students. Um, and uh, uh, since 1999, uh, the, the persecution of Falun Gong uh, made uh, millions of uh, Falun Gong practitioners um, imprisoned, and um, and uh, at least 4,000 of them 
uh, were tortured to death. So uh, the um, uh, committing um, crimes um, against humanity per se um, is a violation of, of uh, rule-based international order. So, so the Chinese Communist Party is uh, definitely uh, a threat to a liberal international order. And uh, since Xi Jinping came to power in uh, 2012, um, things uh, became worse and worse. Um, you know, uh, he uh, rounded up the uh, human rights lawyers and 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 uh, and many uh, dissidents. Um, so at least 300 uh, human rights lawyers were uh, either uh, jailed or disappeared and and or, or convicted. Some of them are still in in prison. So uh, I myself uh, was uh, kidnapped and and disappeared and and tortured in in China. Um, so um, uh, and and uh, and and the Xi Jinping uh, government um, tightened its control on uh, internet, on, on publishing, and 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 universities. So it's um, it's a comprehensive crackdown on uh, the the civil society, um, and uh, especially uh, in in Xinjiang, uh, the East Turkestan. Uh, Chinese government uh, detained uh, one uh, to three million uh, Uyghurs and Kazakh Muslims and other um, uh, uh, ethnic minorities into the concentration camps. And I think that's the, the, the worst uh, humanitarian uh, disaster uh, in uh, 21st century uh, as of today. Um, and uh, so uh, Xi Jinping uh, clearly gave up its um, um, its principle of Tao uh, Guang Yang Hui, which is a, a term uh, by uh, by Deng Xiaoping uh, that means uh, biding, uh, you know, hiding our capacities and biding our time. Um, and then Chinese uh, Communist Party became more and more aggressive on international states, uh, like uh, the South China Sea. Uh, Chinese government um, uh, undermined uh, the, uh, the decisions made by uh, the permanent court of uh, arbitration uh, in terms of uh, South China Sea. Um, and, um, you know, Chinese government even kidnapped people uh, on foreign soil. So I uh, I want to uh, speak about one case, uh, uh, which is um, uh, Gui Minghai. Uh, he uh, is a publisher, a poet, and uh, he published a, a lot of books on uh, the uh, the political secrets, uh, scandals of uh, Xi Jinping and many other uh, top uh, party leaders. And uh, he uh, got uh, uh, the Swedish passport in 1990s, um, but uh, but in uh, 2015 he was kidnapped in Thailand and sent back to to China and uh, of course severely uh, tortured. He was forced to uh, confess um, um, on uh, Chinese official uh, media, uh, and then uh, and then he was uh, released after. Um, uh, after a, a long, uh, long time disappearance, and and then uh, he was uh, taken away in front of uh, the uh, some European uh, diplomats, and and then uh, disappeared again. Uh, and recently, uh, he was sentenced to ten years. So uh, what is um, shocking is that uh, he was forced to give up his Swedish uh, citizenship, and then. Uh, and then the Chinese government said uh, Gui Minghai applied his uh, Chinese uh, passport again. So um, that's really, really um, uh, alarming because anyone uh, can be uh, kidnapped uh, in, in, in any country. Um, and, and, then, and then he or she uh, would um, give up, uh, uh, give up uh, it's uh, their their uh, passport, their foreign passport, 
um, because uh, they were so uh, seriously um, that, uh, tortured. Um, and uh, this July, uh, Chinese um, passed the national security law in Hong Kong. Um, so Hong Kong is also a perfect example that Chinese uh, government undermined its international uh, commitment. According to the uh, the uh, Sino uh, British uh, Declaration, um, the, uh, Hong Kong should enjoy high level uh, autonomy, and uh, and Chinese government will uh, will guarantee uh, the one country two system for fifty years. Uh, but uh, but uh, bit by bit, and the uh, the Chinese government uh, has taken away Hong Kong's freedom and uh, democracy and rule of law. Uh, especially this year, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Hong Kong uh, national security law um, actually uh, totally destroyed uh, the one country uh, two system. Uh, by the way, uh, the, 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 uh, the Sino-British uh, declaration um, is not only uh, a treaty between the two countries, but also it's um, a, a part of the international uh, legal system, um, but but Chinese government uh, doesn't care about that. Um, and uh, there's an article uh, in this Hong Kong uh, national security law, uh, which uh, endangers everyone in in the world, not only uh, in China or Hong Kong. Uh, for example, if you criticize uh, Beijing, if you uh, support uh, Hong Kong's um, Hong Kong's uh, independence, um, and then you have committed a crime of uh, like endangering national security according to this law, and then and then you uh, you might be uh, arrested uh, if you uh, travel uh, to Hong Kong. So that's that's really uh, really um, um, alerting for for everyone. And there are many, many other uh, examples that China, uh, uh, China became an urgent threat to uh, international uh, freedom and rule of law. Um, for example, the Chinese uh, media in, uh, in Western countries, in many other countries, uh, actually they are not media. Uh, they serve as a spy and, and propaganda uh, machine. And uh, and Chinese apps like a uh, uh, like a uh, uh, TikTok, uh, we, uh, WeChat, and many others, they uh, they also um, they also uh, serve as um, a brainwashing uh, machine, and, uh, it, and and these apps are also a threat to uh, to uh, citizens' privacy. Um, so it's 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 good and it's necessary. Uh, to ban these uh, these apps uh, operated uh, directly or indirectly by the Chinese Communist Party, um, and uh, a, a report um, showed that uh, in the United States, uh, almost every Chinese language media uh, has been controlled by the Chinese government. I think it's uh, it's even more so uh, in in Europe in uh, in other uh, countries. And Confucius Institute uh, has become a threat to academic freedom. Um, you know, in uh, in many countries, um, uh, actually, I think altogether there are, uh, there are more than a thousand um, Confucius Institutes and and, and classrooms, um, and it. Uh, blocks uh, the sensitive people uh, from being uh, invited, and 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 also uh, blocks the the sensitive topics um, being uh, discussed. Um, and a professor in New Zealand, um, after she uh, wrote a, a report critical critical of Beijing, um, her. Uh, her uh, home and uh, and uh, office uh, were broken into, and uh, and her um, her laptop uh, was stolen, and uh, for another time her her car tire was sabotaged. Um, 
Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, Chinese government has played a more and more uh, active and aggressive role uh, on international space and uh, uh, and the the, uh, uh, the Western countries uh, should learn a lesson, especially um, you know it's um, it, it's uh, uh, understandable in nineteen seventies when the United States adopted an uh, engagement policy uh, toward China, uh, uh, considering its uh, uh, its uh, Cold War strategy uh, against the Soviet Union. Um, but then after the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989, the, uh, the Western democracies um, also uh, support the Chinese government and they adopted a policy called engagement. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, I think the engagement policy was based on a series, uh, a series of um, uh, uh, wrong, uh, wrongful uh, presumptions. Uh, they thought that uh, to engage China, to encourage uh, China uh, into the international uh, international human rights treaties and uh, the World, World Trade Organization uh, will um, will automatically lead to China's democracy uh, and open society. But that uh, uh, has been proven wrong. Uh, uh, very soon after the Tiananmen Massacre, uh, the United States uh, granted China uh, IMF and the most favored nation status, and a few years later, uh, the PNTR. Um, so the, um, the these their idea is to to delink uh, human rights uh, with trade with China, and uh, so they prioritize um, business uh, over uh, human rights issues, and many Western. Uh, companies also uh, play a very, very uh, bad role um, when uh, engaging uh, in, in China. They practice uh, self-censorship uh, when uh, Beijing um, was not happy about their, uh, their speech or their, their performance. And, uh, and what's more, some, some uh, Western companies even um, facilitated China's uh, surveillance system. <clears throat> uh, for example, the Cisco um, uh, helped Chinese uh, government to establish the, the Great Fair Wall, GFW system, um, and, uh, and Yahoo uh, even uh, provided its client information uh, to uh, Chinese state security. And that, uh, that to um, at uh, the uh, arrest of conviction and long-term imprisonment of at least uh, four uh, Chinese uh, bloggers and dissidents. Um, and, the, um, and many countries like uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, 2001, uh, uh, China was allowed to host uh, uh, Olympics, uh, Beijing Olympics. And, and two years later, uh, Beijing will also host the uh, Winter uh, Olympic Games. Um, but these Olympic Games um, um, actually uh, become an uh, excuse for Chinese government uh, to, uh, to uh, violate human rights and uh, on the contrary uh, to their, um, their uh, promise of, uh, of uh, guaranteeing uh, human rights and freedom. Um, and 180 countries uh, voted China into uh, the uh, UN's Human Rights Council, and it's ridiculous uh, that uh, China, with such a um, such a bad uh, human rights record, uh, was uh, was uh, playing an active role on, on uh, Human Rights Council, uh, as well as other uh, countries with very uh, poor human rights record. So uh, to conclude, uh, it's, it's high time uh, for the world to uh, rethink about the Chinese Communist Party and their, their uh, China policy. Uh, and we should uh, resist the, uh, the, the threat um, uh, from the Chinese government um, to, uh, to the uh, rule-based international order uh, before it's too late. Thank you. Uh Namrata covered most of my talking points. I decided I am going to 
talk about the history of how China violates international rules-based orders across the board, across all spheres of governance, and how they, even after they sign up to treaties, they continue violating things just in different ways. And primarily because of their economic clout, nobody actually holds them to account. Uh, let's start with, say, uh, two of the important uh, weapons control regimes, the Missile Technology Control Regime and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Now, <clears throat> for most of its history, China, uh, most of its modern history as the People's Republic of China, China was one of the biggest proliferators of, uh, 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 sorry, my dog is, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, go away. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, so China was one of the biggest proliferators of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. If you remember the Iran Iraq war through the 80s, China was selling uh, silkworm missiles to everybody who'd buy it, they were selling it to Iraq and to Iran. And it was basically Iraq uh, using the same Chinese silkworms and Iran using the same Chinese silkworms. Till the Iraqis got smart and they uh, and they uh, sort of stopped buying from China. But note is whom China sells to. There is no end use monitoring, which is why, if you remember, in June two thousand and six, an Israeli stealth ship, the INS Hanit, was hit by a missile by Hezbollah. Uh, and the missile turned out to be the latest Chinese uh, C-802 anti-ship missile. Uh, so selling even to non-state actors who are under a UN embargo, and guess what? The Chinese never paid a price for it. There was no inquiry into how they got it, uh, and everything got hushed up. Why? Because they then threaten your businesses in China with consequences, or they use their power as being lavish spenders to get at you. Then taking you slightly back, I'm gonna go a bit back and forth. <clears throat> in 1998, when China did not even have diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia, because the Saudis considered the Chinese to be godless communists, they recognized Taiwan. Uh, they agreed on a deal to sell the Saudi 60 IRBMs. Uh, the CSS-2, uh, also called the Dangfeng uh, 3A, uh, with a range of about 2,700 kilometers, could be fitted with nuclear warheads. And this was kind of part of the Saudi-Pakistani deal that, uh, you know, they will, uh, the Pakistanis will supply the nuclear warheads when required. Uh, there was that. Then it's very important to remember what happened after, Pakistan, uh, after China joined all these uh, international uh, weapons controls agreement. Uh, and you can see this with Pakistan's nuclear program. Uh, it, of course, the, uh, the Chinese help to Pakistan's nuclear program starts off in the 1970s that included testing warheads for the Pakistanis. Uh, it also included sharing designs. Now, the Pakistanis have two different kinds. One is the, uh, uh, is the Chinese derivative design. Uh, basically tested and given completely lock, stock, and barrel by China. The second, because they had a parallel program, was the uh, stolen French designs that were initially intended for the Israeli program. What then happens is that uh, China joins the NPT in 1992, and the entire pattern of proliferation changes. Not immediately, they're still blatantly violating NPT provisions, but they change the method in which uh, they violate it. So instead of supplying it directly, what they start doing is they create a nexus between Iran, Pakistan, and North Korea for developing both missiles and nuclear warheads with different degrees of success. Pakistan was way ahead of the other two countries anyway. It turns out that uh, people who have seen the North Korean design say, in fact, North Korea was actually far ahead and Iran was the most lagging in all of this. Uh, but basically what China did was that it organized the transfer of information between these three countries 
for whatever programs. Of course, each country was a bit hesitant and held back some of the information it had. But China basically facilitated these networks. There are UN reports on this, which again never got acted on. Uh, China's direct help to Pakistan also continued because well after 1992, uh, they uh, helped Pakistan canisterize its nuclear weapons to make transport easier and sort of weatherproof. They also helped in the navalization of nuclear weapons and the miniaturization of nuclear weapons. So Pakistani uh, smaller warheads, the tactical nuclear warheads, are entirely Chinese-designed warheads, which have been handed over to them by the Chinese well after signing the NPT. Uh, there was also the grandmothering clause that they used to build more reactors. And we can tell, I mean, a basic satellite imagery of this uh, of these reactors tell you that, you know, the uh, feed chambers are so much uh, artificially enlarged. The main reason for them is weapons production. Now, the French, uh, whose designs it was kind of based on, you know, French uh, technology is critical to almost every reactor in uh, operation today, in a sense. Uh, the French just refused to provide. They they said they're not going to oppose it. They're not going to make a, a public uh, drama about it, but they're not going to supply the uh, necessary equipment for the uh, follow-on reactors. I think it's the Chashma reactors, if I'm not too, uh, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so that's how the French kind of put. So these reactors are working, but uh, they're extremely unreliable at the moment because they don't have the requisite French parts. You see the same thing happening with MTCR. Now, MTCR, they got smart after China's NPT. The international community got smart after China's NPT um, uh, deceit. Uh, so when China tried to apply for MTCR entry in 2004, they just told the Chinese to go away and you're not getting anything. Uh, but again, they found ways then of proliferating very, very openly as punishment for not being able to get into MTCR. And that is your Iran-Pakistan-North Korea network. Then let's look at territoriality. Now, we have two different laws of territoriality. One is ground laws, which have developed traditionally over a millennia. And then laws of the sea which were developed by a Dutch lawyer called Grotius somewhere in the uh, about 1600s or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Now, what China has been doing is it's particularly curious. They take land paradigms and they extend it out to sea because they don't really accept the laws of the sea completely. Uh, we know modern cartography had come quite a distance under the Qing dynasty, but they never use cartographically relevant maps. They use non-cartographic, uh, ca uh, nothing that conforms to modern uh, cartography to establish claims dating back to the Ming, uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating now, but uh, right up to the Tang period. Uh, and they claim territory here, there, whatever, whatever uh, for whatever reasons. Um, and it's a particularly dangerous paradigm because sea boundaries are much more contested than land boundaries. Sea boundaries have a certain connotation to them. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of uh, paid Chinese commentators saying, ah, look, China settled all its land boundaries. India hasn't settled a single one of its land boundaries. Uh, wrong again. Uh, if you look at how China settled its land boundaries, China basically had, uh, say, a claim, and I'm being hyperbolic out here, of course, but just to, uh, uh, because you wouldn't know the smaller places involved. So I'm going to use big name. Uh, say China claimed all the way up to Delhi. And of course, we'd say, no, no, obviously not. You can't have up to Delhi. So they would then settle for, say, somewhere up in Himachal Pradesh, up to Shimla. Everything north of Shimla is ours. And then they'll say, oh, look, see, China's such a generous power. We've given you territory all the way from Shimla to Delhi, and therefore we're a great magnanimous power. You look at any one of China's territorial settlements, nowhere has China ceded land. It has always been including Russia, including the USSR, to settle the boundary disputes. They had to cede land to the Chinese, not the other way around, including tiny nations like Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, of course, is a very well-known case where they gifted off land that they believe is their own uh, and uh, disputed land in Kashmir, which, of course, we can use to our advantage because we can say, look, there are now three parties to the dispute. Unless Aksai Chin and the land ceded by Pakistan to China also vote, 
uh, the UN resolution, the relevant UN resolution in Kashmir is sort of irrelevant. Um, so this is to do with territoriality. When we come to economics, I'm just going to add on to what Namrata said. Now, the um, I'm going to macro it a bit. Chinese investment practices follow absolutely no known modern best practices. CPEC being a classic example, but OBOR as a rule, I don't know what the latest name of OBOR is. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to call it OBOR because the name keeps changing more times than Elizabeth Taylor had husbands. Uh, so, you know, th there there is no nobody to date has seen a cost benefit analysis of where this whole thing is going. All right. Uh, for example, let's take CPEC. Taking now one of the uh, examples that's been given is, oh, you know, taking gas through the Malacca Straits is so expensive. So we're building a pipeline through Burma and one more through Pakistan to avoid any blockages. Simply does not make any economic sense. You know, gas needs to be pressurized. Uh, one of the things is, you know, wh why a plane, a modern aircraft is pressurized is because if it weren't, your blood would literally start boiling at uh, 40, 50,000 feet. Uh, and this is why, you know, the boiling point comes down significantly the higher the altitude is. Now, gas to be transported over the Karakoram Mountains into uh, China would require massive pressurization, canisterization, God knows what not. Uh, the, the economics of it just don't work out. And yet, they, 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 nobody actually challenges this on the cost basis, on the uh, actual uh, uh, good sense basis. If you're talking about bypassing the Malacca Straits for petroleum, the value of petroleum transported any more than about, say, uh, Please three, four hundred kilometers by truck does not make economic sense anymore. So what are they going to take? Is it going to be small Chinese goods, in which case uh, low value Chinese goods are not going to have enough of a market to, uh, to uh, make sense for $100 billion? Uh, high tech anyway does not go by road. High tech because you know, like a, a phone has shelf life, a market shelf life of about six months to a year before a new product comes out. Apple puts out a new product almost every year, so you've got to replace it. Other companies do it even quicker, uh, so you've got to keep replacing it. So all high tech equipment like chips and things are transported by air. So what remains to be transported by road? Nothing. In fact, this was a lesson that Britain and America learned through the 50s and 60s through investments in Africa. That, you know, just investing in growth. In Europe, in Hong Kong, well, I'm hoping Hong Kong survives, but whatever. In Hong Kong, in Japan, in Korea, it does. Because see, all the other things, the ecosystem, the business environment, the uh, uh, regulatory frameworks, they all work. And therefore, when you add infrastructure, there is a massive increase in economic growth. In countries like India and South Asia, the classic example for an Indian audience is the Delhi to Gurgaon highway. If you remember, there were tolls on it. Then the Supreme Court said tolls aren't going to uh, work out here. You've got to remove it and all of that. And that uh, thing never paid back its initial investment. So infrastructure by itself never works to create economic growth in an environment where the business environment is not correct. So they keep investing these things which are not going to produce any results. Even after Hambantota defaulted and was taken over full time by the Chinese, we have been monitoring Hambantota. It has not increased. It is still running as a loss making enterprise. Right? Uh, they will cook the books for sure. But it will be cooking the books and nothing more because we've been monitoring Hambantota uh, port traffic very, very carefully using uh, satellite. I would invite all of you to do it because it keeps getting updated uh, very frequently and you don't even have to pay for these services. Uh, and this is why you see something very interesting happening in Pakistan right now. Pakistan, Pakistan's elite are trying every trick in the book to stop or slow down CPEC because they realize what CPEC is going to do to them. And if you actually read Chinese, and I think Namrita can uh, uh, talk about this, uh, if you actually read Chinese language uh, journals, there is a lot of complaint about how Pakistan is trying to sabotage all these projects because they realize they've gotten deep in. And Pakistan's gotten a lot worse because Trump, 
is no longer willing to entertain the Pakistanis. The Saudis have almost completely cut off the Pakistanis. You've seen uh, the uh, a complete fracas that happened uh, over these last uh, year or so, where the Saudis cut off the credit line. And uh, now, uh, even though the army chief and the ISI chief went begging to Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he said, no, go away. And then to damage control, Qureshi initially got $1 billion to pay back the Saudi loan. There is one more tranche of $1 billion coming up. Uh, Qureshi, the Pakistani foreign minister, has landed up in China. And what is amazing is the photo of him landing in China yesterday. There is not a single Chinese official there to receive him. That is how China will treat you when you become a Chinese subsidiary ally. So all this talk of, you know, American interference and all of that American treatment of you is going to pale into insignificance compared to how the Chinese are going to treat you if you become a single source dependency on China. But unlike our other speakers, this makes me very, very happy. And I'll tell you why it makes me happy, because it's the best thing that could happen to India. Uh, for starters, almost 90 to 95% of these projects are going to default and go into receivership. And what we need to remember that China seems to have forgotten is that default no longer equals a loss of sovereignty. It no longer equals a foreign takeover. It's not like you default and Britain and France send their battleships and no more Suez landings and all of that, right? Uh, Argentina, for example, went into receivership. Uh, uh, I mean, they defaulted. They, they they were bankrupt. Did you see a full-on sale of Argentine assets and things like that? No. Uh, so Argentina had to be given a lot of sops and want to recover in that sense. The problem with the Chinese is they don't seem to realize that the bubble they've created in terms of their own uh, construction industry, because you see a lot of ghost cities, it isn't going to work everywhere because everybody else can't control their economy and the public discourse around it the way China can. So all of these investments are fundamentally unsustainable. So in that sense, you're going to see uh, in a Xi Jinping effectively is what Khrushchev and Brezhnev were to the USSR. Now, previous Chinese leaders had made uh, uh, very smart decisions they learned from the USSR that they weren't going to repeat this mistake of the USSR in investing money into deadbeat projects and deadbeat allies. Xi Jinping forgot that. He's made the classic mistake. So he is going to do what Khrushchev and Brezhnev, which is spend money that they do not have onto projects that will never yield profit. And while China may not collapse under his lifetime, uh, the net burdens that will have to be accumulated, dead-end projects that can never become profitable because there is no business case for them to become profitable, like we are seeing with Gwadar and Hambantota, because to date, we have not seen an increase in traffic in either Gwadar or Hambantota, uh, is simply not something you can work your way out of. Ultimately, the money will talk and there's only a limit to currency manipulation. The Soviet Union also tried currency manipulation. It did not work. Uh, so you're going to have three kinds of recipient countries of Chinese aid. Uh, the smarter countries will disengage, like Zambia. I think it was Zambia or Tanzania that said, look, buddy, uh, enough is enough. Your uh, proposals don't make sense. Get out. Uh, we're not going to sign up to these treaties. Go away. Uh, the second kind of country are the ones that will turn into Venezuela. They will go bankrupt. There will be massive social upheaval. And I suspect now that Pakistan has burnt all its bridges, Pakistan is going to be the next big Venezuela happening out here. What India could not do to Pakistan, China, its uh, great friend, you know, that the friendship is deeper than the ocean and higher than the mountain, as Nawaz Sharif used to say, that their own dear friend is going to do a Venezuela onto them, something that India was so incompetent and incapable of never being able to do. And the third is you will have countries that will turn into full-on freeloaders. And this is the danger scenario that they turn on to full-on freeloaders like North Korea. Now, what do you do when a country turns into a full-on freeloader like North Korea? Can you give them nuclear weapons? We should remember North Korea was actually technologically very advanced. People don't give it credit for that. 
April 1979, North Korea had the second highest per capita income in Asia after Japan. It was the success state and South Korea was the failed state. Uh, people tend to forget this now. And their nuclear technology, their home-built nuclear technology was already pretty, pretty advanced. We all tend to forget this. Uh, on the other hand, with countries like Burma, one of the few countries that have managed to play the Chinese successfully, they just cancel Chinese contracts left, right and center and kick them out whenever they want. So one of the few countries that China is scared about, about its investments in, is Burma. So I think the Burma model is something we should, and this is where India's role comes in. We should go to all these countries and offer them advice on how to manage China when you default on your loan. Uh, so we should actually be encouraging more projects. We should say, take Chinese money, and when you default, we'll teach you how to the China over. And we could probably have Burmese advisors on teaching people professional courses, how to screw the Chinese over for dummies, 101 ways to screw the Chinese over uh, without them knowing what's going to happen. Uh, and despite, now I know we as academics can talk like this, governments do not have the luxury. Uh, they work on 30-year cycles uh, at most, that is considered long-term planning. And they have to, at some point, say, look, China is building military ports in Hamman, Tota, Gwadar. We've got to do something. The problem for many of us is finding that smart point where a long-term prediction can be synthesized with government policy that does not have the benefit of looking beyond the 30-year thing. And that is the main problem that policymakers face today. So I'll end out here. Thank you. So as I have said, uh, the, uh, the Hong Kong uh, national security law is uh, per se is um, in conflict with the uh, the Sino uh, Bright, uh, British Declaration, um, and uh, uh, and uh, a breach of international uh, international law, um, and uh, so according to uh, the um, the extra territory article uh, in this national security law, I think uh, the um, uh, it's um, it's a, a symbolic threat to to everyone uh, who are uh, like tending to criticize Beijing and the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Um, uh, I, uh, um, of course, it's 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 possible and it's it's uh, uh, likely uh, that if someone, some maybe activist or, or scholars uh, who really criticize uh, Beijing. And 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 uh, uh, supportive of Hong Kong independence, and then if they go to Hong Kong, they might be uh, they might be arrested. Uh, it's likely, but uh, uh, I, uh, I I don't think uh, this article will be implemented uh, completely. That will be targeting uh, too many people. Yeah. So, if if I understand that question correctly, that's my answer. Do you think that China can actually sign bilateral treaties with the, uh, you know, of course, uh, not with UK and US, but with other countries to apply this extraterritorial, um, you know, uh, under the uh, this thing, the national security law? Because if it signs bilateral treaties with individual countries. Uh, stating that anyone in you know their country, if they write something against the national security law, or they you know kind of say something about Hong Kong, its democracy, or you know things like that. Do you think is it, it's possible that countries will uh, sign such uh, bilateral treaties with China or Hong Kong? With China. With China. With China. Um, there's um, actually. Uh, before this Hong Kong issue, uh, I think uh, these uh, Western democratic countries with rule of law um, seldom send these uh, 
bilateral treaties with China because uh, because uh, Chinese legal system and political system cannot guarantee uh, the uh, the fundamental human rights and, and rule of law. So they they tend not to sign that kind of treaties. And uh, but they did sign uh, such treaties with Hong Kong. And and after the uh, the, the issue of uh, Hong Kong's national security law in July, uh, many uh, countries, including uh, UK, Germany, and uh, United States, Canada, uh, have announced that they will um, they will cease the implementation uh, with the um, the uh, bilateral treaties with Hong Kong, because uh, uh, obviously um, under this law, Hong Kong uh, will not. Uh, Cannot guarantee uh, rule of law and human rights. Um, yeah. Does the free world, Western India, really have any actionable strategies to counter Chinese neo-colonialism? Uh, first of all, I don't know from where everybody gets it that China has a very disciplined workforce. I don't know if uh, people have actually studied um, how uh, you know. Uh, workers especially laborers in factories and all are actually uh, treated in uh, china and especially with the hookah system what all they faced so uh, and also if you ask me whether uh, the western world or india has a strategy see tang xiaoping actually said uh, something very important he always used to you know his policy was that lie low and keep working. So his sense was that you don't have to tell the world how strong you are in the sense, but keep building your power. Now, when it comes to uh, leaders like who, now, now everybody says that it's actually every, all the problems have started with President Xi Jinping. Now, if we go back when uh, Hu Jintao was uh, leading uh, China, most of these issues that you see now, South China Sea, East China Sea, with India, it has been long, but of course, the you know the incursions that started it was all all by Hu Jintao. But Hu Jintao knew when to stop and when to like just when to withdraw. Unlike Xi Jinping, who laid out a very bold timetable. Up till then, the world was actually as Abhijit and I also pointed out that it was the economic uh, you know tool that China was using to kind of. Um, blackmail uh, all the countries and kind of everyone was quiet about it. But if you see after this bold timetable that Xi Jinping laid, the US, especially, uh, you know, under Trump, they started targeting China. And even if you see uh, COVID, when COVID came, look at the European Union. Have you seen any, just a maybe um, uh, people or some articles that have come up but there has been nothing that is said against China. The US led the attack, of course, but there has nothing has been said by any of the so-called uh, free world. Because everybody, of course, is busy fighting COVID themselves. But uh, where have we uh, seen that uh, Europe or uh, you know even the US uh, had tightened its screws on uh, China? I mean, when Obama regime was there, the air, Chinese aircraft carrier made only eight rounds in the South China Sea. And during the Trump era, it has already been 22 times. So if you ask me whether the West and India has a strategy, India definitely doesn't have any strategy when it comes to China. And especially our uh, India's China policy, I see hasn't uh, improved over the years. I, I doubt whether we have a China policy. And especially the way... Um, the mismanagement of the whole crisis that we just saw. So um, I really uh, don't think that the Western world has any strategy against China because there are the way Chinese uh, United Front works, the way you know their work is to create a favorable environment for the Chinese Communist Party outside China. The way they have invested, look at India, for example, the way they have invested in our journalists, in our academicians, in our think tanks, in our businesses, you always have a lobby that supports the Chinese. So you also have to understand today, everybody is talking about in India, and this is the so-called strategy we have. 
against China that we are banning the apps, we are banning economic investments. But is India really like, do we have a long term strategy? Have we actually looked at it that way? You know, it is it is like a reaction we have given. But uh, look at Huawei, how they used to work. And Huawei, what they used to do is when in 2007, eight, there was a lot of pressure from a sector of uh, in the government to actually ban Huawei. So what Huawei did was to make sister companies. So now whenever the bidding came, especially for the telecom sector, these sister companies used to bid. But where the material was coming was from Huawei. So strategy, no, we don't have a strategy. Even after COVID, if we don't have a strategy, I I doubt we'll ever have one. Uh, can I uh, can I add to that? I just want to take on yeah. from there and take on two questions that have come on the chat. Uh, so Namrata is absolutely right. India does not have a strategy. And what is amazing is uh, Trump is the first president that I've actually seen who scares the Chinese. Of course, Trump scares a lot of people. Uh, but uh, that kind of unpredictability, for the first time, I've seen fear in China. Now, the issue is one of the things, one of the brilliant strategies that Trump came up with, even though we saw the effects more in Europe, uh, because in Europe, you have far too many freeloaders who bring too many liabilities to the table, uh, but don't bring enough military capacity uh, to deal with the liabilities they bring. And in this case, the liability is Russia. Uh, and what China has been doing is China very carefully hides behind Russia at the UN. They let Russia act as the disruptor of the status quo. And because most of the press is Eurocentric, you see Russian disruptions of the status quo as being much more threatening to the world order in that sense. And Russia does actually tend to be quite aggressive, like, for example, we've seen with the annexation of Crimea and things like that. So, you know, China uses Russia the same way they were using North Korea at some point. And Russia has kind of been stupid enough to walk into that trap as well. But Trump does have a good strategy, which is to minimize the liabilities that come onto the table. And if you want American protection, you need to carry your own weight or you're not going to get it, number one. Uh, but Namrata is absolutely right in where she says that India does not have a strategy. Now, a very smart person I know once said that uh, India is that Xi Jinping is stupider than the Indian leadership is. And I think that's true to a large extent. I think he's one of the most powerful, but yet at the same time, uh, I wouldn't say naive, but uh, sort of a genuinely stupid grasp of economics and politics. And that right now is our saving grace. During COVID, look at the number of people that he's alienated. India, for one, we all know what happened at Galwan. But at the same time, he was alienating people in the South China Sea simultaneously. And America sent not one, but two aircraft carriers. If you remember in 1997, when there was the Taiwan Straits crisis, Clinton ordered one aircraft carrier to sail between the Chinese mainland and Taiwan to act as a sort of warning to China. This time, Trump sent two aircraft carriers, which tells you the seriousness of the Chinese threat uh, that they were posing in the South China Sea. So uh, India's strategy is that Xi Jinping is stupid. Uh, America's strategy is much more direct, and I do think they will have a strategy if they are not so bogged down. Now, to answer two more quick questions, there is this talk. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, is there a divide between the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army uh, that the PLA might revolt against the C uh, CPC? Uh, unfortunately not. The way Xi Jinping has consolidated his power, there is no more coups of that sort possible. What we're seeing with the PLA is uh, a complete castration of the top brass, uh, people are shifted around. In fact, infantry commanders will suddenly be shifted to artillery. Artillery commanders will suddenly be shifted to airborne uh, divisions. Things that they have no skills with, uh, which they tend to be very clumsy about. And the moment they gain comfort, they're immediately shifted out to something else. The second thing that he's done is he's moved, and this is of particular danger to India, 
that he's moved from a ground centric paradigm of military combat you know ground centric to give you a simple example ground centric is uh when we see infrastructure being built in tibet the ground centric reaction of the indian army would be oh my god this is so dangerous uh, the chinese are going to swamp us we need to do something now the air planner in the air force on the other hand will be orgasmic he will say oh my god this is my dream come true before i didn't know where to hit today i've got these clear aim points i know where to hit i know how to uh, completely destroy this uh, particular troop concentration great now china is moving rapidly towards an air centric military paradigm and if you notice this is the same thing pakistan has done in a sense the pakistan army has done the pakistan army is heavily political but they rely on their air force to win a war against india because they can't afford a revolution in military affairs and to downsize their army the same thing you are seeing but differently play out in china where xi jinping realizes it is the ground forces that are a threat to him he's reducing their size and the scope of their authority and the air force is the one that is being given primacy in budgeting and things like that it will take a while but uh, there are many reasons why uh the pla will not really rise up against uh, uh this one and the second part to the question was is what options does indian government have to counter the chinese threat geopolitically and militarily uh lipulek pass no i've not seen anything at lipulek pass on satellites uh, uh but the indian government geopolitically like i said is to accept we can't compete with china uh in terms of outspending chinese largesse that will be like the soviet union with uh, you know uh, one third the gdp of the usa trying to outspend the usa in the cold war you do not want to make that mistake what you do is you send financial advisors to these countries you tell them you know grow rich on debt but learn how to default on that debt default on chinese debt and counter it effectively uh without losing sovereignty i think uh because you know international financial institutions are flooded by indian uh, financial experts i think that is one of the things we can do but like namrata says we do not do that militarily we are doing absolutely nothing absolutely zero zilch nada so that is what uh so the question is on pangong so uh that the chinese are not withdrawing uh what do you think will happen uh uh namrata do you want to take that question yeah and there's another que- um there was another question somebody asked that in 2014 the pla intrusion was carried out entirely by the commander uh this is absolutely false it cannot happen it in china it doesn't work like that that a pla commander will think let me do something when uh, president xi jinping is in china it doesn't happen and uh, i will also inform you that these three commanders that were there all of them were promoted so it was not an action that was taken by the pla commanders without the sanction from the highest authority even now what you see happening uh, this year that we have seen especially uh, with the chinese it is a very planned uh, you know uh, a very planned thing because they have opened fronts at multiple locations they came up with an agenda which was directly sanctioned by the highest authority now the second question uh, abhijit uh, i can't see that question um, can you just uh, kind of help me yeah uh, the question is uh, they uh, because the chinese aren't withdrawing from pangong what hmm. do you think is going to happen specifically in pangong see the first uh, thing is that actually uh, the way indians uh, the first thing is that we were caught napping let me uh, say that very um, frankly that uh, the intelligence failed entirely now what many people are putting forward that i'm hearing is that the indians actually asked the russians that the chine we see a chinese activity is happening uh is it for us and the russian said no no this is not for you and indians very naively believed it now this for me is a total intelligence failure the second failure that comes in the way we handled it and that was a total disappointment for people like us who have been following uh, china especially nothing was and even now nothing is we are hearing uh, things from different people people are writing articles 
people are telling uh, so many pla officers are there they have entered finger eight they have entered here they have entered there using satellite everybody is analyzing on their own but the indian government has given us nothing we don't know what happened what the actual situation is now if the chinese don't withdraw this is a very the, the location that they have come to is very strategic for them and it will be a total loss of course for india when it comes to that strategically it has it is very important because you know one, when we talk about all this it is very important that everybody knows the geography of that uh, you know area how things are going to work out once they you know if they don't withdraw and you also have to see the whole connection now uh, the routes that uh, will connect when you know china has this now india and china has i think they've had more than five dialogues at commander level but nothing is materializing india still um, if you read a chinese language media uh, it is uh, of course the chinese language media is for the domestic audience but it also tells you what they are thinking now the um, yeah, the chinese language media that i am reading these days especially is extremely critical of india as being this expansionist power now what they are feeding into their own domestic public is that india is having clashes with everyone nepal also it is ha ha having with us it is also having with pakistan it is also having and bangladesh the day is not far when india is going to have a clash with them also and india is trying to act as an as a hegemon in south asia they try to kind of cover up what all they are doing but anyways if uh, the chinese don't withdraw it will be a complete failure from a diplomatic and also military angle for india and we will lose a very strategically important point and uh, the way things are going uh, on i i really doubt if uh, we can actually negotiate with the chinese why are ground commanders and intelligence officers are not held accountable for such failures where status quo changes this seems similar to what shiv kunal varma wrote in his book on 1962 war where people were retired or given some other assignments but not punished why are the officers are not being held accountable for their failures i mean i'm i see it, it all depends on um, how um, india probably looks at the whole issue and as i said the way we have handled the whole issue to me i mean the way we handled doklam the way we kind of uh, did, we didn't even send a single representative for the belt and road and we out, the only country that did not send their representatives was india now going by all these things and also the way we held in doklam though of course i will not uh, say that even in doklam there was a de escalation it was only the diffu the tension was diffused okay but the way the indians have handled this entirely be it in the people who were uh, responsible for giving us uh, information the intel information or the commanders see uh, the point is as i said we were caught napping now to hold them accountable of course they are uh, they are responsible but uh, uh, that's the sad state of affairs in india right we asked the russians to tell us why the chinese are moving in this area like and you know we also believe what they say and uh, suddenly we see uh, and it is not the first time kargil was also the same and what, how we are paying for that now we have a um, special unit that is sta uh, stationed in kargil we are wasting anyways a lot of money on maintaining that so uh, they are not held responsible what should be done i think um, um, sorry to say but that's how things roll in india i mean why they are not held responsible of course i can't answer but but that's how things have been even now how do you analyze the whole situation i mean um, were the intel uh, it was an intelligence failure total intelligence failure but what have we done after that even diplomatically the statements that we have issued and a few of the mea statements are actually a direct translation of the mandarin language statements that uh, you know the chinese released so um, i don't know i would just say sad state of affairs that's it um so i'm 
currently living in the United States, you know, the trade war between uh, U.S. and China, uh, and now uh, both Democratic and the Republican parties in the United States uh, want a, a tougher policy um, towards China. Um, so uh, the, the the climate uh, uh, it seems uh, to be changing, um, but uh, you know uh, you know uh, Trump is very tough uh, on China, but um, but um, uh, all his concern is about uh, uh, trade uh, in uh, like uh, 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 the car manipulation of currencies, uh, intellectual properties like that, uh, all these. Um, uh, economic issues. Uh, he uh, doesn't care about uh, human rights or uh, China's democratization. Um, and as I have uh, mentioned, the whole world, uh, especially the Western democracies, uh, adopted uh, the uh, engagement policy toward China for three uh, decades or more. And the um, and. Um, it's um it's a, a engagement policy, but if these countries uh, don't care about human rights or democracy, and the uh, and and doing business with a, a dictator dictatorial regime, uh, it's it's more like a appeasement. So um, so not only the West uh, doesn't have a a a, a, po a strategy. Uh, facing the threat from Chinese Communist Party, uh, but uh, that they uh, are adopting a wrong strategy, uh, that's engagement or appeasement. They, um, I, uh, so I think um, the, uh, the, the whole world uh, must uh, take the, the human rights and democracy uh, issues um, in uh, seriously, uh, if China doesn't uh, respect human rights and rule of law, and it will be uh, urgent and and huge threat to uh, to every country. And here, I would like to thank all our speakers for sharing their amazing views and insights on a very critical issue. And I would also like to thank all the participants for joining us today.